<laughs> so we have a we have an in, in Afrikaans we speak in South Africa we say Friday is my day, Friday is my day. <laughs> yes, it's a good concept. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We are in season three, so we're doing live face-to-face recordings. And I'm managing to track down these guys who I haven't been able to track down at the Berlin meeting. We're here in Berlin at IMR Hiss, the Global Masters meeting. And finally, I have one of the Brazilian legends. <laughs> Ishida, welcome to today's episode of the Rhinoplasty oh, Podcast. Nice to be here, Cameron. Ah, it's great, man. So, how come you've come all the way from Brazil to come here? I didn't get the question. Right? Yeah. How come you've gone all the way from Brazil to come to Europe? Because you live a great life in Brazil. Why do you want to come to Germany? Oh, yes. eh? It's a very important meeting. Uh, we have this uh, European and American Society of Rhinoplasty. Uh, yeah. I must be part of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ishida, tell, tell the listeners, because uh, it's listened to all over the world, this podcast. Where do you come from and what do you do? So, I'm a Brazilian. I look like Japanese, but I'm a Brazilian. Okay. My four grandparents are Brazilian. Wow. So, my, my father uh, is a surgeon, plastic surgeon. Yes. He's retired now. Yeah. And I, I was into plastic surgery since I was born. Like, I was wow. always looking at these pictures. And yeah, yeah. Seeing, and I was, uh, always wanted to be a plastic surgeon. And especially a, a rhinoplasty surgeon. Yes. So that's... That's why I'm here. Yeah. And and your kids, do you think they're going to do plastic surgery? Oh, no. One is already doing engineering. Yeah. And the other one's perhaps going to do architecture. Yeah. Because the other famous Brazilian family, the Patrocinios, who also like this mafia of uh, yes. rhinoplasty surgeons. And eh? there's the Pad- Prado Neto also. They have three plastic surgeons. Sons. Really? He is a rhinoplasty wow. guy. And wow. his three sons are doing plastic surgery already wow. so so i know you also la- we're going to get into the plastic surgery and the rhinoplasty just now but i know you're quite an active sporty kind of a guy what what do you do oh i like a lot of things i surf yeah i skate yeah and dive wow dive with sharks yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully and what else and jog what's... yeah but you're also running a plastic surgery department if i'm not mistaken Yes, uh, actually, I'm the coordinator of the rhinoplasty group in the University of São Paulo. Yeah. Wow. And and what does that entail? Uh, we have a, a group. Uh, there's a faculty. There's the yeah. Department of Plastic Surgery that the, the chief is uh, Wolf Gemperly. Yeah. And w- they are subdivided. So okay. I've got the rhinoplasty group. It's very interesting because we have a. a almost nine residents yeah and we have always two or three of them rotating at the same time really, yes. eh? sure N- now tell me the like globally over the last few years there's this whole thing about preservation rhinoplasty but in south america it's not new to you guys no no we've been doing like we have two groups basically yeah. we have one uh, uh Torin, uh I hard to say. Or I'll, I'll uh, otolaryngology? Otolaryngology. Uh, ENT, yeah, yeah. ENT, yeah, ENT yeah. group. Yeah. That has been doing corto technique for like forever. Yeah. Like more than 30 years. And my father developed a cartilaginous push down. Yes. In 99. Uh, yeah. 25 years ago. Wow. That we've been doing since then. Wow. So, we, and you are talking about in, in the meetings and everything. But yeah. Only after 2016, they start growing up the, the preservation of rhinoplasty yeah. thing. So explain to the listeners about um, the Ishida technique and also like Miguel Ferreira. How did he get involved in this thing? I, I, I wanna, I'm interested to know. Oh, this was very, a little bit unfortunate for him because he's a very genius guy. And uh, we have described the cartilaginous push down. And he was una- uh, unaware of it. Yeah. And in 2019, uh, I think almost 20 years after, he published something very similar. Yeah. Then he got to know that we had published this before. Okay. That it's fair A, but it's not okay. the same. So yeah. bit, but it's the same uh, yeah. philosophy. And the worst thing happened is that I published a paper in 2020 
And then, but when Soviet, that he was thinking also, so he published almost the same thing, but he included my name. Uh, was, he was very kind. And uh, just one year after. But wow, eh? So it was kind of fortunate, but the ideas are a little bit different. It's not yes. the same thing. But so explain to the listeners from your side, how, what exactly is this technique? Oh, it's very interesting. I'm going to tell you a story. Yeah. My father had a patient in the private office. I was, a, I was in practice with him already. And this it was a guy who had, had a punch in the nose. Okay. And he came and said, oh, I want you to do my nose because it's very wide. But I like my new profile because he had a very, very big hump. Okay. And the punch corrected it. Okay. And so we, we went on the, into the surgery uh, together with my yeah. father. And then we wanted to see what happened. And the septum, cartilaginous septum, had fractured and overlapped. Wow. Okay. So my father told, uh, why don't we do this on purpose? Yes. So we start doing, and the first case was were, were horrible because they began to be, be very wide because it was like a punch. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> supposed okay. to be this way. We went to the septum, cut it, and overlapped it. And after the tenth case, then it began to, to look very nice afterwards. Wow. Eh? And then when did you, or did you ever get to the point where instead of overlapping the septum, you actually cut a part of the septum away and you let those two pieces lie straight on each other again? Oh, oh yes. The first case we did, we overlapped, and I said, yeah. oh, no good. Then we, we took a piece off, yeah. so right in the first case. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But it's so interesting to know. So this is 25 years ago. So now, okay, so you're reducing the septum, but what about the lateral walls then? How did you initially, when this was starting, treat the lateral walls? The big uh, challenge was to get the guts to do the uh, lateral undermining from the lat upper lateral from the nasal bones. Okay. It took a lot of courage because yeah. every book you got said you don't touch this area. The like the lateral keystone area. Yes. Okay. This was the, the problem. This is was terrible because we couldn't t touch it, uh, and then uh, then we got the courage and we did it, and then after this well, everything was okay. Wow. Okay. So, the, but that's interesting for me now. Because I know Goxel has described the ballerina maneuver. Is this almost a bit like with what Miguel tried to describe what you guys had done before? The same or no, not? No, I don't see this way because the ballerina maneuver, you get from the posterior portion and you go the second to the anterior portion okay. and you keep the keystone area attached. Yes, yes. For the cartilages push down exactly the opposite. We start with the keystone area and we go laterally i so, understand okay so we go incrementally like if you don't want like in a male you don't want to lower too much the nose you keep a little bit attached on the the board and yeah. the sides yeah so you need you don't uh, you must take care not to release everything all together yeah. at the same time so he goes from one side to the the front and we go from the front to the back side okay well that's very interesting okay and now in terms of your general technique of teaching and, and operating, are you are you doing a lot of endonasal work? Are you doing more open approach to the nose? Where, where, where do you work at? Oh, it's a good question. We have, we have in Brazil, we have a, a strange situation because the skin is very heavy yes. and the cartilages of the tip are very weak. Yeah. So we tend to open more than I would like. Yeah. Every time we can do close, of course, and the nose in Asia, it's faster, heals faster, but we cannot do in all patients. Mm. We have, uh, I say, I don't think, I, we, we, I make a joke that the food Brazilians eat because we have this patient, that, all these patients that have, the four grandparents are Italian, for example, and they still have this weakness on the middle pura right below the domus. Yes. It's very flimsy. So it's a place that we can we, we can treat it close, of course, but if we open it, it much better to, to treat. Yeah. So I then I open almost forty to seventy percent of the cases. Yeah. But so so a, a topic I've been discussing with a lot of the people on the podcast lately is is like the mental aspect of rhinoplasty, um, and the few things that I'm interested to know is 
how do you look after your own mental well-being as to for you to be remain as healthy and happy and focused when at times you have difficult patients to treat but it's also quite a busy job i mean you've got yes. residents you've got to teach you traveling the world that kind of stuff oh that's a very important question after the, this covid pandemic uh, i changed everything yeah uh, I'm planning. I'm almost doing this. I take off on Fridays. I do not work on Fridays. Beautiful. So I get to serve Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, we have an, in Afrikaans, we speak in South Africa, we say, Friday is my day. Friday is my day. <laughs> yes, it's a good concept. No, but uh, the, the thing is that... Uh, I made some financial planning for the clinic, for the, the employees and everything, yeah. and we did the math. And we have certain amount of surgery we must achieve during the yeah. month. It's not like... Uh, and we did this calculation, and then we can... That's brilliant. Eh? Wow. So you plan your rest. Like we used to plan that as well. Yes. You first plan your, your, your big event and your rest, and then you fill in the rest. Yes. Wow, eh? Sure. Of course, there are months that we work more and some work less, but... Okay, so now another question from for the audience, as it were, is um, what advice would you give them in terms of dealing with difficult patients? Um, I'm not saying technically a difficult operation, because that you have to learn and you've got to... But mentally, like body dysmorphia or something like that, how, how would you go about that? Yeah, I think, I don't know in South Africa... But uh, we, as plastic surgeons, I don't know, in EAT also, we lack this kind of training, like mm -hmm. in the psychiatry's mm -hmm. uh, aspect of the patient. Uh, it's good to be able to diagnose some, uh, uh, like, uh, dysmorphophobia of the, or something, yeah. uh, uh, beforehand. Yeah. And even, even with the training, like, sometimes you escape. Like, I, I had one patient five years ago, that had a dysmorphia, a very serious, it was a very intelligent person. Yeah. And thank God it went well, but it, it, I had a very hard six month. Really? Eh? All returns. So well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm also happy to hear that because it's hard. I, I yes. at times, to tell you completely honestly, sometimes I just want to stop doing what I do because you only need one difficult patient. Yes. You can have everybody else who's happy and you're happy and then you get this one person who can yes. ruin your life. Yeah, almost. it's terrible. But I, I should have seen before I, I did yeah. the surgery on her. She was yeah. very difficult because she was like a, a dentist yeah. and uh, she she had uh, all her parents were doctors and she yeah. didn't know how to speak and, and she like, she drove me and said, really? no, I don't care how much I, I'm going to look after the surgery. I just want this and this correct. I said, I can correct this and this. Yeah. And then after the surgery, everything changed. So, but looking backwards, she gave a little, some signs of this, yeah. this problem. You I, have I, didn't, I didn't yeah. catch it. Hindsight <laughs> is an exact science. Okay, <laughs> she had a last little topic to chat about before we go and listen to some more of these lectures is social media and rhinoplasty. What are some of your thoughts around that? Oh, this changed the world. I think I, I think we can we can the, the pandemic and the, the, the Instagram the, in Brazil at least it changed everything because uh, we usually receive the patients that came from our colleagues and our other patients mm. and now there sometimes knocks in your door some patient that we never seen before mm. uh, from other countries mm. still they, mm. they they get you on Instagram yeah. And this, you must be very, very cautious because uh, nobody knows this patient. So you need to interview yeah. and talk more. Yeah. But I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Like it uh, globalized the, 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 the people and the, yeah. the surgeons. I think yeah. it's not, you need, we will need to adapt, but I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Eh? <laughs> Listen, I, I, I so enjoy your energy. I really. It's, it's amazing to, to be around how excited and enthusiastic you are about life. And uh, it, it's, it's a good thing, man. You teach and you, you're there and you're operating. And I know that, that um, you 
you're giving a lot in Brazil, but we want to try and bring you into a on the world as well. And we've spoken a little bit about this. The first time I'm mentioning it on the podcast, but we're doing World Rhinoplasty Day next year. Oh, this, this will be great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so guys, you're going to watch this face, but uh, Ishida and I are working with a couple of other guys and we're going to really try and put something very special together for next year. And hopefully we're going to get you to South Africa. Oh, I hope so. Then I can I get to dive with sharks again. <laughs> <laughs> guys, thank you so much for listening. Um, we, we, we're going to cut it off here and head off to listen to some really interesting talks. But thank you for listening. And Ishida, thank you so much for taking time off to come and chat and, and, and just share your pearls of wisdom. Oh, thank you for having me, Cameron. Nice to be here. Awesome. <laughs> Guys, come back next week for another episode.